looks like we've got some attendees trickling in. Um, I'm going to give give people a few few seconds to arrive, and then we'll get started. I guess you've all been patiently waiting for this to start uh, already, so um, bear with me a second while we wait a little while longer for people to people to join. We're gradually going up through the through the teens, almost at twenty. <clears throat> All right. All right, let's get cracking. So um, welcome to Makers, everyone. Um, I'm Eddie. I'm one of the technical coaches at Makers. And today I have the real pleasure of um, introducing to you the March 23 cohort. And you're going to see four really awesome projects that they've been working on for the past couple of weeks. But I'd like you to bear in mind that um, it is just a couple of weeks worth of work that you'll see. And this is the end of um, a pretty grueling 16 week journey. Um, lots of them started with very little previous um, experience or knowledge of programming. And so um, we started with the absolute sort of fundamentals um, and kind of worked up from there to the point where they can now build some really awesome web applications which I'm sure you'll um, you'll really want to kind of get your hands on and, and play with yourselves. So um, bear that in mind as you're as you're watching the presentations. Um, after the presentations, so there's going to be four presentations. Um, some of the uh, some of the teams will be taking questions, I think, at the end. And you can, if you have questions, you can put them into the the chat. Um, and I'll keep an eye out there for them. Um, not all teams will take questions, though, so just watch out to see if they have the any questions slide at the end of the presentation. So I'll have the four presentations. And then um, if you have questions for myself or for um, my colleague, Nikki, who's on the call, um, about life at Makers, about the course, um, this kind of stuff, then stick around at the end and you can ask questions of us. So. Um, First up today, we've got a team that um, is, is particularly mission-driven. Um, they've chosen to try and uh, help tackle a, a real problem that, we'll, that you'll, you'll have seen around the place. And I'm talking in really vague terms because I don't want to you know, spoil the surprise. I want to let them introduce it properly themselves. But um, I think what they've done is, is really, really cool. And um, I'm sure you'll enjoy seeing their presentation so i'm going to hand hand over now to uh team food share you can probably guess from the team name what they're doing um or what they've done um but uh, over to you team food share Hi, we are Foodshare, a food waste app that connects food banks to local supermarkets, restaurants and other food outlets who wish to donate their surplus food. Our motto is waste not, want it, reflecting our mission. Foodshare was developed out of a desire to alleviate two major problems, food waste and hunger. In the UK alone, we throw out 9.5 million tonnes of food a year. Yet there is a surging demand for food banks. In May 2022, the Independent Food Aid Network, representing 550 independent food banks, found that 93% of their food banks reported an increase or significant increase in need for their services since the start of the year. Of these, 95% said it was due to the cost of living crisis. Now on to Madeline, who will discuss our users. So our application has um, two user type. Uh, the first user type is uh, the one that's making the donation and we call it Food Hero. Um, and these are the companies uh, like supermarkets, coffee chains, or any small business businesses that wants to make a donation. And the second user type is we have the one that's collecting the donation, which our targeted user is uh, um, food banks. Um, we chose to name the roles <laughs> to give a sense of empowerment on both the people that are making the donation and collecting the donation. We want to highlight the transformative impact that each user can have by participating in this food sharing process. 
I would then pass it on to Robin, who will talk more about the product. Yeah, uh, as Maddie said, our app involves like two user types, which allows us to strengthen these local communities. One way we do that is by reducing the stigma about getting support as we offer an efficient method to access surplus food of our app. This in turn has significant positive effects on the overall physical and mental well-being of these communities. Uh, a notable feature of our app is the statistics dashboard available on the account pages, which provides users with summaries of their activities. And the idea behind this is by showcasing their contributions and accomplishments, we're trying to instill a sense of pride in those users, which will act as a motivating factor for them to carry on using the app and doing good in the communi uh, community. Uh, we also wanted to create a seamless experience for users, allowing for the collection and donations to be easier. One way we did this was by incorporating a status filter and uh, having an ordered feed. This was done in an attempt to make the users feel more integrated with the local communities and empower them. So everyone's actively contributing and making a positive impact, resulting in a stronger and more inclusive community. And now on to Manuela with the processes. During these two weeks working on the project, we had some ups and downs. We started the project focusing on presentation as opposed to functionality. Then we shifted our focus to testing and backend. We chose the MERN stack, working with what we know so we can have more time to implement complicated features. We listened to advice on previous project fairs, which really helped us achieve our MVP faster and implementing new ideas into our project. And now to Jamie and Aria for our demo. Thanks so much, Thomas. Wait for that to get up, thank you. Um, okay, so I'm gonna be the, the food hero to start with. Um, so if I'm like a new user, I'm coming to this page, I'm looking at the sign up form and I see, be part of the solution, cut food waste, support local communities, um, I like I said, I'm a local business, but I'm still not 100% sure. So I'm going to find out more. So I click on find out more. Um, it's going to take me to an about page. So you can see all the information that Solmas was talking about earlier. We can see the two different user groups that um, Maddie mentioned. So hero and rescuer. Um, so yes, I know I'm going to be a hero. And we've got our food hero calculator. So um, it's going to give me the amount of energy produced by my weekly waste. So roughly I throw away two bags of waste a week, let's say. Um, so it says here I could charge my phone 884 times with that energy, which is absolutely crazy. Um, so I've got no choice but to sign up as a food hero. So um, for the purpose of the demonstration, I've got an account already. So I'm going to go type in my uh, credentials. So I'm at the local Asda, Asda at asda.com. Um, and I log in and I can see all my donations in one space. So each donation is broken out into its own little card. Um, you can see we've got the description of the donation. Um, we've got other information as well. So um, the expiry date and the donations are actually ordered in terms of their expiry dates, the most recent at the top. Um, and we can see the status, so available and completed. I can also filter the entire space for this as well. So. Um, I'm going to look for some of that oak milk that looks like it's going off. Um, and that's still available. So hopefully someone's going to come and collect that soon. Um, but now I want to make another donation. So I click add donation at the top um, and I'm going to add a description. So I look in the cupboards um, and I can see I've got, um, I think it's three tubs of ice cream. Yes, so three tubs of ice cream. Uh, and I want to get rid of them ASAP because they're going to melt. It's getting hot. So I'm going to set the expiry date tomorrow. I'm going to submit that donation. And you can see it appears fourth on, on there. So near the top um, in order of date as well. So that's great. And then I go to my account um, where I see a dashboard of the impact that I'm making, which just gets me really excited as a business owner, makes me want to keep getting involved with food share, um, return for more, and obviously you see my account information as well. Uh, so with that, I'm going to log out and pass over to Aya. So here we have the toggle function, which allows us to switch between users. So I now want to switch from a food hero to a food rescuer, and this is food banks. So I'm signing up as a local food bank. So in this case, Hackney. And then after I log in, I will be redirected to a list of donations. And we have who the food hero is, for example, Asda, Tesco, and what they're donating, and the expiry date of the donation. 
So here we can see the one that Jamie has made as ASDA and the expiry date of 10th of June. So once we click collect, um, we can see once again our food hero and the description. And then once we click confirm, we'll have a confirmation code that the food rescuer can give to the food hero to collect their donation. And then once we press take me back to my feed, we can go back to the list of donations. And then my account is just for simple um, data about your account. Yeah, thank you for watching, guys. Amazing. Um, any questions? Oh, thank you. I'm sorry to have interrupted you, Solmas. Um, uh, amazing presentation. Really, really lovely work. And um, uh, great, great project. Uh, I love it. Um, looks like the team are happy to take questions. So if you have a question, if you're an attendee and you want to ask a question, um, I think you can stick it in the in the chat or you can use the Q&A feature. Up to you, really. Um, yeah. Any questions out there? I'm going to give you a moment to type if you're typing. Question from the uh, from the panelists. Controversial, Jack. Uh, well done. That was awesome. Really great idea. Uh, my main question is: How did you? get it to translate from bags to how many times it would charge your iphone i thought that was really clever because mm. that sort of thing will sit right in someone's head yeah that was just like a um i'm gonna say simple uh kind of calculation function on the back end that kind of spews out a number on the front so um yeah i can't really <laughs> that was like a i'm gonna be honest it was a last minute addition we were like should we just put something here that like gets people roped in um so yeah. Well, it wrote me in. Great idea. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Jack. Cool. Awesome. I didn't see any more questions. If, if you have asked a question and I missed it, I'm I'm sorry. Um let's just double check the QA panel. Nope. Okay, so um really well done, folks. Uh so the next team um has uh has has taken it upon themselves to to um kind of like i guess sort of you know continue contributing to the uh to the world of education um so at makers as you might expect people especially people like me the coaches spend a lot of time thinking about um you know how people learn and and what people need to learn and um you know what does learning look like what's a good a good environment to learn in and um it looks like this team has been thinking about the same thing um, so again, I'm not, I'm going to try and avoid saying too much and, and spoiling things, but I'm looking forward to the presentation and I'm sure you'll enjoy it too. This is team study buddy. Hello everyone. Uh, I hope you can, uh, see my screen. Okay, so um, I'd like to introduce a remarkable group and our ambitious project. Team Study Buddy have developed an app um, that rethinks the concept of study groups in a way where users can not only create and join a study group, but benefit from an artificial intelligence system. The AI was inspired by the iconic Sheldon Cooper, and it possesses the uncanny ability to respond to user inquiries just as Sheldon would. Now, what sets this project apart is the unique feature of storing all group conversations, uh, especially that of Sheldon, which ensures that every member, including Sheldon, has continuous access to the knowledge exchange within the group. Um, now, I'd like to introduce you to our lovely team. So, we have Sirkan, who unfortunately couldn't join us, but we thank him for his contributions. Um, same for Q, he, uh, I think he's here with us today. Um, Kat and Anna, Jack, 
and myself. Uh, now we're gonna give you a little bit of a, an insight of how we've done everything. I'm gonna now pass you down to Anna. Hello everyone. So I'm Anna and I'm going to talk a little bit about the idea behind our website. We came up with the study buddy because we want to help out and make it easier for students to find study groups and resource for study in one platform. So we know that studying alone can sometimes be isolating, difficult and overwhelm. So by creating a platform where students can come together, create, a, create or join a group, and engage with participants, ask questions, ask recommendations about books, we could foster a sense of community and support among people. So also with the Sheldon AI, we could provide an additional resource so you would have an uh, answer right away. And also you would have fun with Sheldon, of course. And that's how we came up with Study Buddy. And now I will pass to Hannah to talk a little bit about how we planned everything. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Anna. So in terms of planning, I think this was very crucial for us to, to develop this. It took us an entire two full days, which um, again was key. We designed our app with the user experience in mind and how to make uh, things more easier uh, for somebody to study and share uh, their interests and their knowledge. We then did a mock-up and then we map out as many tickets as we possibly could. Um, and, and again, this was this was it. This, this is the key to our success. Um, another key, another key uh, to our success was the way the databases were created. And I'm going to pass it down to Jack and he can tell us more about it. Thanks, Juana. Today, I'd like to highlight the seamless integration of our project's components through MongoDB and Mongoose databases. MongoDB is flexible and scale, scalable and allows handling of large amounts of data without, without prefix structures. Our project relies on five databases all interlinked. They're categories, subcategories, groups, posts, and users, all working together to create a cohesive user experience. For example, user data stored in the user model personalizes the experience and it includes email, username, and group memberships. Through this integrated approach, our database system manages data seamlessly, empowering users to discover, connect, and collaborate effectively. Uh, thank you very much for listening. I will pass you over to Partan, who will talk you through our AI integration. Yeah, thanks, Jack. Um, so I'll be sharing how we integrated the AI into StudyBuddy. Um, using OpenAI's API key, we enabled AI responses in the user-made groups. By securely storing the API key in the .env file, we're able to sep separate the, the API from the code base to avoid any conflicts. So our trusty AI bot, Sheldon, um, he provides uh, personalized support in the group. So a user can prompt questions like, hey, Sheldon, how can you reverse a string? And Sheldon's language processing, he analyzes queries and generates helpful responses. This integration enhances the user experience, fostering a more collaborative learning uh, experience for the users. Uh, it, its general ability to recognize patterns and intelligent decisions really improves the user's overall experience. And that's how we knew it would be the best fit for study buddy. And now I'll pass back to Juana. Okay, the last bit is the user experience, but I will let our presentation speak for itself. In terms of technology, we kept it simple and we used the men's stack. So um, quite a powerful stack of technologies uh, where we developed uh, leverage Node.js and Express for the backend development, MongoDB for data storage, as Jack mentioned, GitHub for collaboration, Miro, Trello, Excalibur, and so on for planning, and obviously OpenAI to uh, infuse our app with um, the personality of Sheldon Cooper. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our project. Welcome to Study Buddy, your perfect companion for productive collaboration. Here we can sign up with email, username, and password. You can also choose an avatar from your files and set it. This will appear in the top left once you've logged in. Um, here are all of the groups available to you. We can use the filter function to filter through subject category, subcategory, level, and group. 
let's have a look at the arts and join that. Here we can see that people are already discussing arts on here, so we'll let them know that we'd like to work with them. We also have our Sheldon AI, which is an AI based after Sheldon Cooper from the Big Bang Theory. So if you ask Sheldon a question, it should respond like Sheldon. And when you press the button, it says Sheldon is thinking and gives you a response. This is saved into the day space after sending a prompt to OpenAI. So it, Sheldon's favorite painting is the Mona Lisa. I couldn't agree with you more. Great answer. Here we have the other members that are part of this group. If you click on their name, we'll show you the other groups that they're also part of. This is the group for the profile that we're on. If you click on the profile on the top left in the nav bar, you'll be able to change all of these parts. So we can change first name and last name, go back to art, which is now in the study group link, and click on it, and then now our name is updated on there. We go to tools. We have Miro, Zoom, Trello, Excala Draw, and Pomodoro, which are all things that we've used consistently. So let's set ourselves a timer so that we don't work for over 25 minutes without a break. We can also create a group. So we can create a group for Sheldon for Big Bang Theory and give it a description. We can select category and subject category, sub subcategory. Sorry, subcategory will change when subject category is chosen. We can set the limits and what level we'd like to work at. Public allows anyone the background, and that should appear here in the groups. We can join it. Now we can either start conversation and wait for someone else to join our group, or we can ask Sheldon AI a question. All the questions that we ask Sheldon AI are visible to everybody that's within the within the group, so that there's so that you no longer have to share um, share a screen if you're using a tool like ChatGPT. So we've asked Sheldon to join our group. He says he's flattered, but doesn't have time, unfortunately, which is a classic Sheldon response. So here we can leave the group. As you can see on the left, we have study groups. And the study groups tab will increase as the more study groups you join. You can also use the search bar to search by name for study group. And now that will appear in the study groups tab. Thank you very much for listening. And thank you, Jack, for that amazing video. Welcome to Study Buddy, your perfect companion. Every single time. Um, so any questions? Oh, really nice work, folks. Excellent presentation and really uh, superb uh, project. I really love it. Um, so yeah, any questions? It looks like there's a question in the Q&A panel. Are you gonna are you gonna look in the QA panel yourself, study buddy, or shall I read it out to you? If if you could please, yes. I will read it out to you. How does study buddy compare to chat GPT? Why would you use study buddy instead of directly asking chat GPT? Awesome concept though. So um I think in terms of that, the ethos was that if you ever use chat GPT, you can share that and and you can have a group work so our idea was for everybody to have the same information in the same place um and it also differs because we have sheldon cooper so you know in a st stressful environment when you get together and you study and with all the pressure um you added a little note of humor nice yeah i think it just stops the screen sharing as well you can all like reiterating what honest what Anna says it is just that you're all reading it off the same page. That's the big difference. Cool. You're using you're using open AI's tools, aren't you? I think. Is that right? So yeah. it basically has all the knowledge of Chat GPT plus the extra features that your app brings. So um that's why. Cool. Lovely. Thanks for the question, anonymous attendee. And um, great answers. Any other questions? Oh, is there another one? There's two more open questions. Which one came in first? I don't know. They're both time, maybe the one at the top. Uh, how did you implement the AI's character, Sheldon Cooper? Uh, 
Um, that might be for Anna, who I believe wrote a script for the AI to know how to answer, if I'm correct. Yeah, so if you write a script where you simulate a conversation, how you want the open AI to answer, you give it as much as information you can uh, give, and then uh, the open AI will learn from this and answer in the same pattern always. Cool, nice, really nice answer. I'm going to mark that one answered and then we're just going to take one more question as it's been asked um great concept would you know the buddies in your study group or will that be anonymous um realize that's me too oh, KJ, go for it no uh, i was just going to say so the um you it's not anonymous you can see as you in as sort of displayed on the um the video you're able to see people's profiles you can see some of their details um but it's nothing sort of super invasive you're able to have a different sort of um online presence suppose you don't have to share any of your true details um you can just have a strict username but it's not anonymous but i hope that answers it nice cool thank you and thanks uh, thanks so much for the questions um really really great work folks so on to the third presentation um I uh this this next presentation um is uh it's a, it's another awesome presentation I'm trying to, I'm trying to ad lib a little bit so as you can tell I'm trying to think of like which details I want to tease you with without giving away too much of the story and um there's a way that I would really love to describe this but I think it gives away too much of the story which is why I'm now hesitating and uh waffling a bit um uh, I think if you're if you're a parent with children that you that like to have stories read to them, you're going to love this product um, because ultimately it will uh, give you infinite possibilities for for stories that you could read them. So that's my little teaser. Now I'm going to hand over to AI Tastic Tales, and they'll tell you the rest of the story. Perfect. Thanks, Eddie. So, yeah, welcome to AI Tastic Tales, where imagination meets AI. And we'll talk a bit about that in the next slide, um, bringing this to life. So, you might know these popular characters very well. You've got your Rapunzel, Spider Man, Darth Vader, and you also know their stories very well. But what if you wanted to take these characters out of their stories and actually create your own stories using your own imagination? Well, if we go to the next slide, we might see some scenarios where that can come to life. So imagine if you wanted to perhaps take Rapunzel on a trip to a weekly shop to the Tesco. Just imagine that. Or if you wanted to take Darth Vader to fight some crime in the desert. Well, with our product and a few simple prompts, you can actually transform your idea into an AI generated story and image. So here you can see a couple of chapter outputs that our product created. And as Eddie mentioned, some use cases might be if you were a parent and you wanted to take your child's favorite character um, and create a new story for them, or if you wanted to create a personalized greeting card for, for a loved one using their favorite characters, um, the possibilities are actually quite endless. And with that being said, I'll pass it over to Uma. Thanks, Idra. So when we launch our app, we land on the landing page where the users ask to make some choices about which character they want to create a story on or and which genre they want to set it in and the artistic style they choose. They are also asked to provide the prompt to kickstart the story to kind of give it a bit of a context. So in this case, let's say Darth Vader is riding horses with stormtroopers in a Western uh, story in a cartoonish image. What happens in the background is our application will send an image and some uh, text based on the story. And you have a few options here. You can either, if you don't like the picture or how the story started, you can refresh the story where you will get another one where, with the same sort of configurations. Uh, but if you're happy with what you're getting, and you can then steer the story into any kind of direction you want. For instance, uh, our first initial story was riding uh, 
on horseback with stormtroopers, let's just say, going into a construction site. And what's going to happen is you're going to get another image. And then the first chapter that you received is going to be tied in with the next chapter you've also put in. So our uh, story is going to continue and then the context is going to change. Uh, you can continue the story as much as you like. You can refresh the story if you don't like any of the chapters. But let's just say, I mean, the context, it, the prompt doesn't have to be just context only. You can just say stuff like uh, going to the local saloon for a beer. And in chapter two, Darth Vader was fighting with his opponents. But in chapter two, he's going to be in the pub and then he's been defeating, he's defeated his opponents. And then he's just went to the pub for enjoying a, his drink. So at this point, you can continue, as I said, or if you want to read through what you have done, uh, what you have kind of received so far to kind of get an overall read through of the narrative, you can click the story so far where you'll receive the renderings and the uh, chapters all on a scroll page that you can have a look through. And if you want to start over, you can just click the home button where everything will kind of reset and then you can restart the story with different characters, configurations or prompts. Uh, I leave it to Danny to talk about our prompts now. Yeah, thanks, Amit. So as you saw in the video demo, each chapter of the story is associated with an image. Each of these images are AI generated images that are created by sending prompt to an API called Stable Diffusion. Now, because it is a pretty new technology, the images we receive sometimes aren't the most accurate, to say the least. With only a few prompts, as you can see from the three prompts below, you get the image of Hermione on the left which in all honesty was actually the best image considering the other options we had had Hermione with three arms or like 15 fingers and just whatever your imagination can, can hold. Therefore, in order to prevent that from happening, when the user selects Hermione in the back end, we add a large list of prompts that we send into Stable Diffusion, which further refines the AI's ability to create a higher quality image. And then as you can see on the image to the right, it's the same selection that the user chooses with extra prompts that we then add in the back end, which as you can see is a much higher quality and overall better image. So now I'll pass on to John, who will talk about how we use ChatGPT. Hi guys, so we used ChatGPT for the text generation, um, which was really good. Um, our coach asked us halfway through the week, how was the AI behaving? Um, I think my answer was when I thought about it like a toddler, um, with a lot of potential, but needs a lot of supervision, otherwise it sort of goes wrong. Um, and we achieved this by building a command line app, which may, meant we could um, interact with ChatGPT easily from our computers. And we sent it system prompts, which, which give it a role and tell it what to do and what it will be and how to return the information. Um, I'd like to illustrate some of the problems with this, maybe just by the next slide. Um, and so we've just got two sentences here, which are obviously very, very similar. And actually, if you look at both of them, if you're going to explain to somebody what you wanted, a person, you'd probably use the one on the left. But that it was a little bit unclear to chat GPT, so it kept on returning us one to three chapters. The, the, the sentence on the right returned us one chapter sort of continually. I, I think the way we sort of started looking at it was if it had a little bit of a context, and maybe if it could do some critical thinking, it would probably work that out, but it doesn't. So use it more like a natural language processor. Um, and yes, with a lot of wrangling, I think we got some good results. Uh, I'd now like to pass on to Natasha, talk about design and process. Great. Yeah. So um, in terms of our planning and design phase, we knew from the beginning we wanted to use AI generated images and text. And this slide just shows some of our ideas on day one. Um, but our challenge at the beginning was to scope out the possibilities and the limitations of the AI models, because there are countless ways that it could be used. And we had to add some constraints. So first of all, we explored whether we could make a character from scratch. But the issue that we were getting with the image generator was that we couldn't get the same character look in subsequent images. It doesn't really have a memory like ChatGPT does. So we decided to go with popular fictional characters instead. And that means that the model had much more knowledge of those and it produced much more consistent pictures chapter to chapter. Um, and then here is uh, just a look at our MVP. So we really had to scale it back. Um, and uh, this is sort of what we achieved by the end of day four. Um, because we were exploring the limitations and the possibilities of the AI, uh, we had to have quite an agile approach and adapt our design continuously the more we um, found out what we were getting back. Um, from here, in the second week, we went on and explored whether we could get a continuous narrative from both images and text based on user input. 
Um, and with that, I'm going to pass on to Chris to talk about challenges and learning. Uh, thanks, Natasha. Yeah, just got three of the main challenges here. Uh, obviously, when you use an API, uh, one that's got a company behind it, you get a limited token, so the amount you can use it. So we really had to discover how to mock these site tests with the complex replies we were getting. The second one uh, was the long loading times, which uh, obviously the more data you send, the the harder it is for the AI model to understand what's going on. So that that's really to do with the user experience and how the user interacts with the program and what content we get back. So that was a bit of a juggling exercise. And then finally, I think Danny touched upon it was the image results and how we were refining the prompts we were using. So as you gave the user uh, some inputs, we then added to those with positive and negatives, as Danny said. And that was once again, a bit of sort of a juggling exercise between those two. Uh, and that's about it for our group and hope you enjoyed the presentation and feel free to give us any questions. Wow, another really, really awesome presentation and uh, fantastic product. Um, and I totally agree with the person commenting in the Q&A that uh, it's really cool that people and, you know, particularly, you know, the last two teams being an example. Um, uh, makers are starting to integrate AI into the into the apps. Um, it's really, uh, really exciting and interesting to see what you're doing with these things. Um, so any any questions for AI Tastic Tales? Are there any? Uh, here's a question coming in. Uh, so are there any safety concerns given this is geared to kids? How would you get around this? Um, the models that we're sending API calls to actually have self-built filters in. So even if by some chance it kind of gets through our app and gets forward, it's, it's not going to return anything. So we won't be able to display. I mean, our servers won't return any text or images if the input is a bit uh, not great, let's say. Good answer. Any other questions? Something in chat, maybe. Let's just check there before moving on. I think it was all appreciations, yeah. All right, Nathan wants his own story. You can do that later, Nathan. Um, cool, okay, so thank you once again, AI Tastic Tales, really, really great work. Um, and we move on to the final presentation of the day. Um, um, so as, as you may or may not know, in, uh, in Tibetan Buddhism, these are probably words you didn't expect to hear today, in Tibetan Buddhism, um, people build these things called sand mandalas that are incredibly detailed and beautiful little creations made, as the name suggests, out of sand, which is just kind of loose on a surface um and then after some time they get destroyed they just get wiped away even though someone spent tens or however many hours making it and it's beautiful it's just wiped away and i guess i'm no i'm no buddhist and i don't it's not something i profess to have any expertise in but my um i guess my sort of instinctive understanding is that it's connects to the the buddhist ideas of everything being temporary and um, you might or might not see the connection with this next <laughs> with this next team's work. Personally, I think that there are times when um, in the functioning of this application, you see something a bit like that happening, where with, albeit with sound, um, something very beautiful is created only to disappear and um, never exist again. And so um, I'm going to leave you to ponder that as you see the next and final presentation, which is uh, Team Lupo. Uh, welcome to our presentation. Um, we're gonna start off with a run through of the website and then we'll talk you through our journey. Welcome to the London Underground Phony Orchestra, or Lupo. 
the data, visualisation and sonification of the London Underground Tube Network. On entering the site, we have three main components, the navigation bar at the top, the left-hand sidebar and the map. As a user, you're able to navigate around the map and also zoom in and out to get a full view of the tube map. On clicking the tap in button, names of stations disappear and sounds and visual effects are activated. The default sound set is orchestra. Each line is routed to a different instrument within the orchestra and each station is playing a different pitch. When a train arrives at a station, a visual effect is triggered with the sound. We have a number of sound sets that we can switch to. The second sound set after orchestra is tube drums. There is also a string sound set. And finally, a marimba sound set. Each line on the left hand sidebar has an individual slider feature. This allows us to control the volume of the individual instrument assigned to the line. It also allows us to simultaneously control the opacity of the line on the map. The page also has a mute button which will turn all the sound off and we also have the ability to turn all the visual effects off. We can also navigate to the data page which will give us graph representation of the arrivals. And finally we can return to the map on the navigation bar or we can exit. Welcome to our team was made up of Matt, Sam, Tom, Pablo and myself and we're going to talk you through <laughs> our journey now starting with Sam who's going to talk about our team goals. Thank you Nathan. So when we sat down initially we first tried to figure out what really aligned us together as a team and we quickly realized that the problem we wanted our program to solve was us wanting to make something fun and creative. After our goal was set, we set out our team chart and decided a strong focus on collaboration, having fun and making something interesting were the most important to us. Our program needs to be visually and audibly pleasing. We could only do that if we had a shared vision. So what ended up being a key, uh, key part of our process were our daily stand-ups and retros. Every day we would come together to share what we had learned, what we had achieved and what we wanted to achieve each day. And that was critical in combining the various technologies we were learning about. And at the end of this journey, we've ended up with a program that we are all really proud of. It looks and sounds fantastic, and we've had lots of fun along the way making it. And next, Pablo is going to take us through the data aspect of the program. Thank you, Nathan. So having decided to use practical data to make people smile, we then needed to find a data source that worked for us. And it didn't really matter where that source came from. Uh, we were keen to try and find a data source from nature and became excited when Sam showed us a site which used lightning strike data, which surprisingly seems to be happening continuously somewhere in the world all the time. But we found that the data sources that we'd looked at involved technologies that which were new to us and we didn't think we'd have time to incorporate them into this short project. So we came back full circle to our original idea, which was using Transport for London data. Uh, which is freely available and didn't even need an API key, a key for. Uh, so next we had some dilemmas 
about how to deal with the data, since what we were getting was all about future events rather than things that were happening right then. Uh, we worked out that we could queue real-time triggers, or as we did, create hundreds of set timeouts all in one go that would then resolve over the data period of the data that we chose to collect, which was 30 seconds. Uh, next, uh, well, quite quickly, we realized that TFL's data was quite unreliable and dubious, and it took us a few days and making graphs uh, that would show all the data in real time to realize that, uh, for example, all the Northern Line trains would come in a single moment, creating an explosion of sound and then silence. Next, Tom's going to take us through the audio of the website. Thanks, Nathan. Nathan and I took the lead on the audio side from the start, making use of a framework called Tone.js, which is itself built on top of the underlying web audio API, a powerful audio engine built into the browser, which allows the developer to chain together audio nodes a bit like a modular synthesizer. Tone provides built-in digital synthesizers, and we experimented with these first before deciding that they were too sweaty techno dungeon and not enough Royal Festival Hall for us. So we settled on using Tone's sampler instrument class and providing our own instrument samples. Keen to experiment with our initial ideas, we ended up transitioning straight out of the R&D phase and into implementation seamlessly. Towards the end of the first week, we found we had a problem that the audio team was not working in a way that totally complemented the approach being taken with the incoming data. And we overcame this problem by creating a diagram outlining the flow of execution that could be shared amongst the team. This helped us to get on the same page and agree on how to move forward more effectively as a unit. A learning from this project was that finding the optimal balance between an agile and a waterfall approach is difficult when there are many unknowns at the start of the work. And finally, Matt's going to talk us through a range of blockers that came up during the project. Um, yeah, in working in this project, we encountered uh, a couple of blockers. Um, initially, uh, we needed to learn about using and working with SVG files, which is an image file that's made up of lines of code instead of pixels. Um, originally, our tube map was over 100,000 lines long, but after some effort, we managed to cut it down to a more manageable and svelte 18,000 lines. Um, one challenge that this caused was that the amount of effort is needed to for someone to go through the map and then assign a unique ID to every tube station uh, so that it could be manipulated by the code ended up being quite labor intensive as we found out that um, two people could not work on it at the same time as one person's um, work would overwrite the others. Um, from there, another blocker that we faced was that um, as we were working with some pretty large components in the project, we had to the issue of um, large merge conflicts when it came to adding the um, work into the main line. Um, this was because the code underneath it was changing constantly throughout the work. Um, we remedied this by making a decision to merge code that was um, not finished, but it was working to avoid bottlenecks and lay foundations for other components to be built upon it. And that concludes our demo. If you'd like to check out our website, go to Lupo on Render. Dot com and you can play with it there. You're listening to Lupo. Amazing. I hadn't seen that little little flourish at the end before. Who who's who's singing there? Uh, me. That's Nathan. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> Cool. Uh, again, really amazing presentation and uh, such a fantastic project. Um, really, really fun, a fun one there. Um, are you taking questions? Yeah. Cool. Any questions? There was there was a couple of questions already. Um, uh, important question. What was the website called? Could you show the Could you show the slide again, please? Yeah. I can also type an answer. It's lupo.onrender.com, lupo.onrender.com. As a heads up, if if every single person starts going on it, it might crash because uh, we, you can only send a couple of uh, API calls every second. So if there's 50,000 API calls happening, it might have a bit of a, <laughs> bit of a problem. That, but that's that's TFL's problem, not ours. Yeah, and I guess, I guess you're on the free tier with OnRender, right? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, so if anybody goes there tomorrow and it takes, a, it might take a, a minute or something for the application to start up but um that doesn't mean it's broken um the applications on on render sort of go um into sort of standby mode if no one's using them 
Um, and what you get very much depends on the trains, so you might have to wait a little bit. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Awesome. Really, really lovely presentation. Any other? Any other questions? Oh, sorry. Yeah, there is a question here. Which tech stack did you use? Uh, well, it started out as a MERN stack, and it very quickly just turned into a UN stack with just React and Node, because we realized we didn't really need a database for anything. Nice. Good decision. Any others? Any other questions? All right. In that case, um, all that remains is for me to say well done to all of the teams. Um, if we were doing this in person, I would encourage the audience to give you one final round of applause. Um, so, you know, we can't hear you, attendees, but if you do want to clap on your own in your house, do it now. And the, the, pa the panelists, the people presenting can just imagine you doing it, cheering away um you know raucously in your in your living room or kitchen wherever it is maybe in the in your office um go for it um uh, and uh, now have you come have you have you turned your camera on nikki because i'm handing over to you yes <laughs> i'm going to hand over to nikki who is going to facilitate the q a session for anybody that wants to ask questions of us the makers team Cool. Thank you so much, Eddie. And thank you, everyone. Um, all your presentations are absolutely incredible. Um, yeah, I'm always so impressed with Demo Day uh, projects. So innovative. And yeah, the last little bit, um, little sound bite at the end there. Uh, it was a really good finish off, uh, finisher. <laughs> um, so yeah, basically, so um, uh, myself, Eddie, and uh, Inej will um, take, you, uh, take any questions you have. Um, anything about the admissions, any of the, anything about the curriculum, life of makers, um, any questions you have, just pop it in the, the Q&A box and um, we'll do our best to answer them for you. Um, I'll just have a little look and see if there's any at the moment. Okay. Um, there's no questions at the moment. Um, I suppose um, I could kind of go through when our next start date is for, for the next cohort. Um, it will be on the website, but the next one uh, starts on the 10th of July. Uh, and Inej, I'm not sure if there's still, I'm assuming there's still places for this one. Yeah, excellent. Um, and that's yeah. how delivery, yeah. Yeah, so we still have places for the 10th of July. Applications are still open. The timeline is a bit short for you to get through the all the application stages, but there's definitely still, still time for you to be on it. So yeah, if you're interested, put your application down. Perfect. Amazing. Well, we've just got our first question in. Um, so someone is asking, can you do finance free, like pay after the course is done or do you pay up front? Um, and is, I think you can answer this one. Yes. So the overall cost of the course is eight and a half grand. The way it works is that once you go through all the application process and you get an offer, we'll ask you to pay a deposit of 850 to secure your place. And then on the first week of the boot camp, so imagine you go for July. So on the week of the 10th of July, we'll ask you to pay the remaining amount of fees. Now, if you're looking for scholarships or any opportunities to um to fund the course, what I would advise is uh, if you are a member of any coding groups or coding community at the moment, we have some partnerships. So check within your coding group if they have a partnership with makers and apply straight from them. Some of those spaces are fully funded. Also, we have a partnership with the Department of Education for fully funded spaces. That's on our website. If you scroll a bit down, it says the um, Tech Skills Bootcamp, if you click on that link, you can find the application page straight for that. Just check the eligibility criteria on that one and see if you meet that. And last but not least, we have a partnership with a, oh, a couple of companies. Uh, the, ones I, the one I would advise the best is StepX. StepX is a company that we partner with for funding. Loads of students come through them. Uh, basically, you need to qualify through us first, get that offer, and then you apply for StepX. They are a loan company, completely independent from makers. Um, but yeah, it's a great option if you don't have the eight and a half upfront to get. I hope that answers your question. 
Amazing, thank you. Um, so uh, an anonymous attendee is asking now um, if it would help to get an idea what could be done in two weeks and asking if they can share the number of projects that have been done in three months. I don't know, Eddie, if you um, could kind of maybe offer a little bit of guidance on how, much, how many projects they do. Sure, sure, sure. I'm just going to read through the question uh, just to get it straight to my head. Um, I was sort of an idea of what can be done in two weeks. Okay, yeah, so you've seen what can be done in two weeks. Um, and bear in mind, that's two weeks, like, right at the end of the boot camp. So um, this is, you know, this is the sort of the pinnacle, I suppose, of what can be achieved in two weeks at Makers. Um, can you show the total number of projects done in three months? So um, that's kind of a tricky one because there are, there are quite a lot of projects scattered throughout the boot camp. Um, some of them are very small. Um, and some of them are large and different learners will take on a different number of projects. Um, but probably a better answer to your question would be um, to talk about it in terms of the number of modules. Um, so um, the, the, the 16 weeks, I'm sorry, I normally, uh, so we have, as, as, as at least someone on the call knows, there is um, both an apprenticeship program and uh, this, which is the not apprenticeship program and the programs are slightly different. And so um, I normally coach on apprenticeships. And so while I'm talking right now, I'm buying myself some time to uh, find um, a reminder of, of the structure of this course. So um, there's- I can help you there, Eddie. It's all right, I've got, uh... it. I've got it, I've got it totally. Um, so, uh, weeks one and two are module three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Yeah, so there's nine, nine modules. Um, some of those involve doing. Is that right? Is that what you were going to say as well? Uh, yes. So on cool. academy boot camps, basically, they have three projects over the course of the sixteen weeks. Uh -huh. uh, three main ones. Yeah, two um, led by the coaches, and the last one, like this group, they this completely up to their creativity. So these That's are the amazing. three teamwork projects, aren't they? Yeah. And then outside of that, they'll do a bunch of other smaller projects as well as individuals or in pairs. Um, so uh, yeah, thanks for jumping in, Anesh. Thanks for your help there. Um, uh, I hope that answers your question. If not, you can ask another question and ask for clarification. Thank you very much. Um, so Grace is asking now, uh, I want to know when you're taking on apprenticeship, apprentice, apprenticeship, apprentices. Um, so basically we have several apprenticeships throughout the year. Um, they are not, it's not like a sort of, um, there's not a certain uh, month or week where we get it sort of release all the apprenticeships they kind of come staggered so um for example we had recent ones with like ovo and apple and you know like uh, really big companies taking on a lot of apprentices and then um we'll have maybe a few smaller companies taking on some apprentices um we have compared the market we have you know so it's, it just kind of depends but i would say that if you are really really looking for the apprenticeship um, definitely follow us on LinkedIn, make sure you're on our social media channels because we post there very first before we post on any other job um, uh, job boards. And also I would encourage you to, when we do put an apprenticeship out, um, don't be sort of discouraged if you don't get through to that one, because what we do is if you apply to one apprenticeship, you get put into an apprenticeship, uh, the maker's apprenticeship pool, where we will notify you if another one pops up. Um, so yeah, it's it's you know it is it is quite competitive for the friendships. Um, there's a there's a lot of interest, but um, definitely don't be discouraged. Um, keep applying and make sure that you're checking our socials. I would say daily. Um, because when a friendship does come out, usually the deadline to apply is very short. It's usually like sometimes they give a week, you know. So it's yeah, you just want to be um just aware of that. Uh, just give yourself time to get everything everything done okay um ne next question is do you have dates for the next funded online cohort um so with dfe in i don't know if that's been announced yet 
No, so on the FE, for example, we have no news when the next one will start. Uh, so we still need some details with the Department of Education there. But if you're looking for funded, like through one of the scholarships with the coding groups, you can definitely, uh, if you are a member of one of those, you can definitely pre application now and start with the July, for example. Uh, or if you want to go to StepX, same thing, 10th of July would be fine. Yeah, and, and also we, um, we do offer scholarships. Um, through various partners of ours. So we work with Codebar and Coding Black Females. And we've just uh, launched one with Smellies and Tech. Um, we've got, yeah, we've got quite a, a few places. I think we've got 24 places throughout the year. So if you are in any of those groups um, and those community groups, definitely um, look to apply. Uh, if what I can do is um, in follow up email on Monday, I can add that in. Um, just by chance if anyone is in those community groups and they can apply through that and that is fully funded that's a fully funded places for a boot camp um okay next question uh when you finish what happens do you receive paperwork what type of job offers have the students received um i suppose in terms of the um paperwork and things like that and i don't know if you could shine some light on that and then I can maybe talk about the job, the companies, people. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so you receive a certificate of attendance for the academy. So the normal regular boot camp that we do, you receive a certificate of attendance as you did the course with us. Also the hiring partners that we work with, they are fully aware of our curriculum. So they are fully aware of the skills that our graduates come after the course. Um, because the job, I'll pass that on to you, Nikki. Yeah. Um, yeah. So in terms of job offers, um, uh, what we our kind of process is basically we have a partnerships team who will um, find companies that want to hire junior engineers and we will bring them in. They'll come in for careers fairs or um, if not, they'll do lunchtime talks. Sometimes they'll meet you before. Um, and then there'll be a, several jobs open for those roles. So we have um, I think we have like over 300 companies we work, we've worked with previously. So it's quite a big, you know, um, we've got a big list and, you know, we've got Monzo, Right Move, Deloitte. So we have, um, you know, it's, 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 it's a really, it's a really great team that we have and it's their sole purpose to find companies that want to hire you. So um, it's in addition to that, to the partnership team, getting companies to come in, you'll also get additional support. So you'll have, um, you'll have coaches that will help you with uh, interview skills and uh, prep so if you have a technical test they'll help you through that they'll um, they'll give you workshops on um just anything anything i suppose that will support you in in getting that role um so yeah it's it's the roles usually i would say it's junior junior engineer but i don't know if eddie if you have any sort of other scope on that on the job specific it's, roles i think this i think it's typically a junior engineer that people people go into that role occasionally people will go into slightly different roles like um software developer and test um which is just another another type of engineer basically um so those are the sort of typical typical routes um occasionally someone might go into um another technical role like a sort of junior devops engineer something like that perhaps with a little bit of a little bit of extra um, training in between the end of the boot, the normal boot camp and the start of the job, but um, most people will go into a junior software engineer role. Yeah. So the next one kind of, I suppose, sort of rolls into that a little bit. It says, "How long?" Uh, Rob's asking, well, "How long would it take you to become a junior front end web developer after completing the course?" Um, usually, um, we uh, we say to people who start the course, "Give yourself three to six months um, preparation for job hunting." Um, that can vary. Some people get a job straight away. Some people have to wait a little bit longer than the six months. It's really hard to predict, um, just depending um, on the industry. But I don't know um, if either of you could shine any light on your experience with that. It's um, it's not a part of the process that I'm closely involved with. So, mm -hmm. um, but this sounds about right to me. Inesh, do you have? Yes, yeah, so I think currently from the statistics we had from the beginning of the year, it was taking three to five months after students graduated to get the job. Uh, and they were getting it, I think it was from the fourth interview they had. So from that time, they were 
uh, most of them were hired, um, which is a great prospect, but this always depends on the current job market. So what we are saying now might not be what you will find in four months once you graduate. So it always varies. Makers offers the support because for example, these students that did the demo day today on Monday, they are enrolled on this new journey, which we call the job hunters. So they'll start the process of, of find, trying to find jobs and we definitely support through that journey and you can even get one-on-one -on -one support. Uh, but yeah, there is no job guarantee, let's say at the end, the teams, all the teams will be there to support. Yeah, exactly. And I can, what might help um, attendees sort of understand that process is if I um, I can share the alumni survey and that kind of gives you a timeline of, you know, how long it took them to get from junior engineer to senior engineer and kind of, you know, that that process um, after makers, which um, I'll, I'll share in the follow up email. Um, okay, next question. Oh, Grace. Yes, Grace, I will send the recording. Um, I'll be, I will be able to send it tonight, but I can send it to you on Monday for sure. Okay, next question. Um, it's asking, you had pre-course before, do you provide any extra resources in addition to K Replit Intro to Python to prepare for bootcamp? And what cohort will use? So we can answer the first question first, and then go into the second one. Um, yeah, Inez, you're probably best to answer this for the pre-course material. Yeah, so basically Makers has just revamped the structure of the boot camps and things are working a little bit different. The first cohort we are trialing that will be the July. So very exciting. So we are dropping the pre-course. Literally those first four weeks of self-learning uh, are out and we are going straight away full time for 16 weeks what happens is that uh, we are cutting so uh, we are dividing the cohort in eight weeks on a foundation into software development and then eight weeks in a specialty of your choice those specialties can be software development, cloud engineering, data engineering, and quality engineering. Uh, so then around once you are at the latest weeks of your foundation, you can choose, you can even ask one of the coaches to guide you regarding the curriculum. You might have questions, so they'll be there to support. Also on our website, you have, you can download the brochure in the curriculum because it comes with loads of details about this new verticals, but no pre-course anymore. Uh, in regards to, case replit we are still gathering because this change from ruby as well to python is very recent so we're still gathering resources and what we are currently advising is definitely do um the github intro to python and then move on to code wars uh to practice 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 basically on some classes in there uh but yeah um also Kay is doing some taste to use the sessions with us uh, that might be really helpful for people who are working through code wars. So that's definitely worth giving a shot. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the next question is asking, what cohort will use in addition to, what would the cohort use in addition to Python and JavaScript tools like Flask, for example? Um, Eddie, is this something that you? Yeah, exactly. I can talk about it a bit, yeah. So, um... Uh, towards the end of the course, you know, for these final projects, um, the the learners have kind of like free reign really to decide what they what they want to use, what tools they want to use. Um, prior to that, uh, there'll be Flask. Um, I think there's bits of React in there as well. There's the testing frameworks that are used alongside those tools, so PyTest and um, I think it's Selenium um, or Playwright. Um, and what else is there in there? There's a couple of different database technologies. So in the first, um, and this probably all falls in the first eight weeks. So um, there's uh, an SQL database called Postgres um, and the tools used in order to interact with that from a Python application. Um, and um, later on, there's uh, a, um, a project involving uh, a database called Mongo, which you will have heard one of the um, one of the teams talk about today. And again, the tools required to interact um, from a JavaScript application um, with that. Um, and um, other other bits and pieces of like front end tooling and um, um, uh, this kind of stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, um, so Grace, you've asked, um, 
you've not heard from us. So actually, Grace, I recognise your name from the Taste of Tuesdays. And I know that Kay had said that you had you were struggling to get emails um, through from the follow up. So what we can do afterwards, and, and as you could probably help maybe with this, is we could see on HubSpot if uh, Grace has got like, unsubscribed or something to our emails, because that might be the issue um, on why uh, she's not receiving them. Okay. Next question is, please, when is the DWP apprenticeship starting? Um, I have not received note of when that's starting. And as do you know when that is beginning? I think we had a, a recent DWP apprenticeship application going through, and I think they have already selected the candidates probably by this stage. Uh, not sure when that is starting, but if you haven't applied for that and if you're looking for apply, maybe the next round of DWP would be uh, best because I don't think that one is still live. Thank you. Okay, the next question is asking, so are most of your students self-paid, like they used or borrow money or pay for the course or are they apprentices? Um, so, I mean, we've got a mixture, so we do one a cohort per month sometimes we do two in the boot camp and then we have various apprenticeship boot camps throughout the year um all separate so with an apprenticeship you get paid from we when we're front loading the training you'll get a salary from day one and then you do that three month boot camp and then you go work for a uh, whichever company you're doing an apprenticeship with um so that's and then with the boot camp um there's various we, we'd sometimes have a variety of different people in one boot camp. So some might be sponsored places um, from our community partners, but some might be from DFE. So it's it's um it can be quite mixed, but um yeah, I, I hope that answers your question. I, um it's yeah, it's, it's it's very mixed, but definitely the apprentices do not do not pay for theirs. Okay. Um Grace is asking, how can I access to mentorship? I mean, it's a really good question, and I think a lot of people ask about, you know, mentorship in, you know, in the tech industry. I suppose a lot of people talk to us about that. We, as a company, have discussed, you know, what we can do to help with that. Um, we have a, a, an initiative every year called Women in Software, and we've always sort of, sort of said we'd like to sort of create a mentorship program on the back of that. But at the moment, we don't have that. Um, available I think for our students they obviously have access to our coaches and they have access to everyone in our company so it's um, which is a kind of I suppose a mentorship um, on its own through that because you have access uh, to all this advice and you can talk to the coaches whenever you need to um, but at the moment there's nothing uh, I suppose that's called a mentor for available at the moment. Uh, next question is hi you mentioned the students start the job hunting at the end of the boot camp is it possible to start the job hunting process with the partnership team before the end of the boot camp for example after the first month or the second month um i i suppose that's probably not you wouldn't you wouldn't have access i suppose to the resources in terms of um the careers fairs and the uh, lunchtime talks until you finish because you don't go into that next step um I don't think I don't think that's ever happened to anyone in a cohort but I could be wrong I don't know if Inej if that if anyone's ever asked to do that or um uh no also because um we want students to fully finish the training and be able to acquire all the learning that we're trying to transmit because we also need to secure the quality for our hiring partners here. So definitely um, students have to go through the whole immersive training, the 16 weeks, and that's when we can guarantee that you have the skills and the capabilities to go uh, for a job placement with one of the companies. You can definitely do that search on your own um, and send out TVs uh, to companies that might be hiring but that's something completely um, individual to you. Yeah I have heard of students doing that where they've pretty much secured a job like a couple of weeks after they finish because they've really um, you know just um, spoken to companies about roles starting after they've qualified but um, 
yeah our, our partnerships team definitely want to make sure you're um you know fully fully formed and you're you're ready to go into work you wouldn't wouldn't want to go that un, unprepared into the workforce i suppose um okay next question is asking last time i checked the brochure it was not updated so nice to hear there's a new version with up-to-date information thank you yes yeah, so we it, there's a lot of new th new information coming out at the moment the the um the curriculum is going through a bit of a transition so uh, yeah everyone's sort of trying to update everything as as quick as possible so we'll make sure we get the the brochure sorted um very soon <laughs> okay uh, uh next question by rob could you kindly recap the information on the apprenticeship or can you send contact information to follow up please my connection dropped um so rob with the apprenticeship i can send you lots of information in the follow-up email usually i do after demo day anyway but um if there's any if you want any specific question answered regarding apprenticeship just pop it in the q a because there's probably lots of things we could go over but um if there's anything really specific about it you'd like to know I just asked in the Q&A. So Grace is asking, kindly could you add me to the DWP apprenticeship list? Um, I think you, I don't think we can do that at the moment. I think we'll have to wait till the next round because that will, the next one won't be live. So basically I think Grace, you could probably best just to, I think wait until the next one goes live and apply for that. Um, unfortunately our team can't add anyone um but if you get yourself in the apprenticeship pool which i believe you can still do through the website um then you'll get a notification when the next one's out but then just to add here as nikki said before like the best way for you to find out more about apprenticeships is to um have a look once a week to Makers LinkedIn page, go to profile posts and check all the comms that have gone out on that week because apprenticeships get posted in there um, all the time. So definitely that's the place to have an eye out for. Yeah, 100%. Okay, let's see. Next question is, you mentioned the course has changed to Python. However, some of the inf information packs are outdated they still mention ruby is makers running out of money or are departments not communicating um so the reason why some information packs haven't been updated is because the new python curriculum is very very new and we have a lot um of documents to update so unfortunately it's just a case of um our our team trying to get things done as quickly as possible and sometimes these things take time to do the updating of uh, documents. Um, but if but when whatever information I send you after this will hundred percent be updated. So don't worry about that. You'll make you'll you'll definitely have the correct information um, to go by after this. Okay, next question is asking. I have a friend doing the makers course right now, and she said her course is fourteen weeks and has a one week break, so in total fifteen weeks but the newer courses are 16 weeks. Is there a reason behind this? I believe this is because of summer break, Inej, is that right? Or is this? Uh, yeah, and the 14 week course was our um, transition to the new delivery of the course as well and the new structure. So that's our one off. Uh, I believe that's the 30th of May um, boot camp that started. They are on a 14 week, 15 because of the summer break. But yeah, that's the different one. But the curriculum is there. They will get everything that the previous structure and the new structure will get as well. So we managed to pack everything and come back to them. Thank you. Um, so the next question is asking, how often do you have apprenticeships with Apple? Is there any soon? Um, so we just had one that was out, I think it was six weeks ago. Um, so I would imagine that um, we will work again with them soon. We've got um, lots of different uh, apprenticeships that we've got open. So we've got uh, data quality and software engineering and DevOps. So I know that there's always talks, you know, with Apple around having continuous business with them on our different verticals so I would imagine there will be however I can't give an exact date because you know um we we, we don't know until it's released so um keep it like we said keep an eye out 
on our socials and you will hear it there. Um, also, another thing to add as well, we sometimes have events, um, for example, with the Apple Apprenticeship, we had an event where we invited people to come to Makers to actually meet the Apple team. So if you have us on, if you don't already, you should, well, I think you probably will after, if you came to this demo day, you'll be on our event, right? Um, yeah, make sure just to keep a lookout for our events, because sometimes we have apprenticeship specific events that will be really useful for anyone who wants to, to do that program. Uh, okay, Rob is asking, how much experience slash knowledge would you say I'd need before starting the course? Um, you don't have to have any experience. Most of uh, the majority of our students are career changers. We've had I think ballerinas, we've had you know nurses, we've had um, I think we had a stonemason <laughs> at some point. A lot of people come from lots of different backgrounds and have not done any tech we just ask that you that you um, have a passion for it and have a keen interest and that's why we ask um, you to do challenges before you um, in your application process so that we know you have a keen interest and that you're going to um, do really well in the course and um, yeah so that's to answer your question um, no you don't have to have experience can I, can I jump in with a with an addition um, so I, I did the course myself almost 10 years ago uh, and then worked as a software engineer. And before I did the course, I didn't have any experience as, as a software engineer. Um, and so, you know, that kind of kind of worked out all right for me. Um, and lots of people, lots of people are in the same boat that I was in. Um, but so don't don't let it hold you back if like you want to start in the next cohort and you're in the same position. But I think anything you can do before you start is 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 an advantage, right? The course is pretty tough. And um, it's a, it's a pretty so it's going to be a pretty intense sixteen weeks, um, and so the more you can do to prepare, the, the better. The more likely you are to not completely be overwhelmed during the course, um, and the you know the better position you'll end up in at the end of it. So um, it's, you don't, it's not necessary to have a lot of experience, but if you do a bit of practice beforehand, or the more you do, the better. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think as well, it's, it would be really helpful to, um, for you to kind of understand how our coaches work. Be, uh, try and attend one of our Taster Tuesday workshops and just you'll get to meet the coaches and it will give you an idea of the pace of learning so that you know that this is right for you. And um, yeah, it's, you're not going to be scared by it when you um, join the course. Um, okay, next question is, how many employees do makers have? How many, oh, sorry, how many teachers, oh, sorry, the questions keep popping up. How many teachers and sorry. what are the coding backgrounds? Um, I suppose you could take this one, Eddie, with the coaches and their backgrounds. And Sure, sure. I mean, to give you a good answer, I'm going to have to get a list of people in front of me because I can't remember all off the top of my head and their backgrounds. But I mean, the backgrounds, the backgrounds are, are sort of mixed in a sense, right? Because um, everyone has worked at different companies in the past in slightly different, you know, technical roles. Um, I think all of us have some experience as software engineers and some of us will have additional experience as like a DevOps engineer or a data engineer or someone with you know, some slightly different software engineering experience. Um, some of us have done the boot camp ourselves and then gone away and worked as engineers and come back again. Um, and others have, have taken a different journey, um, perhaps been self-taught or gone to university and studied computer science. Um, the team is, has, is, has fluctuated a bit recently, um, but I think there's about... Uh, about sort of eight or nine technical coaches at the moment. Don't quote me on this, but if it's if I'm wrong, I'm not far off. Um, what's the other part of the question? Um, what are their coding backgrounds? Are they self-taught? So yeah. Um, yeah, I think I I suspect. Let me think about who's in the team at the moment. Um, certainly, there are some self-taught engineers at Makers. Um, yeah so a mixture of backgrounds how many and how many employees do we have does anyone know the total number of employees i think we have 89 89 that's a lot more than i thought we had 
I know, but when I started, it was 50, you know, so that was almost two years ago. So, yeah. Yeah. When I did the course, there was about 10. (laughs) God, that's why you got the good breakfast in the morning. (laughs) Probably. (laughs) Um, Cool. Uh, I hope that answers your question. And we'll go on to the next one. Um, Where Rob's asking, where on the website can I find apprenticeship information? Um, So it's... uh, it's on the higher side. You can download the brochure, but with actually, Inej, I'm just on the website just now. And if you see scroll the- a bit down, uh, you can see Makers Academy, Makers Apprenticeships, Learn More. Uh, if you click on Learn More, you should be able to uh, put your email to get notifications for an apprenticeship comes up as well. Yeah, so the very bottom um, apprenticeship and it comes up apprenticeship opportunities. It's very small writing, actually. Maybe that's something we should flag, but um, that's where you'll find out um, and how you can get onto the apprenticeship pool. Okay, next question is, do you have students burn out due to the intensity of the programme? Um, I suppose this would be a good question for you, Eddie, because you work directly with the students. Yeah, burnout. Um, I mean, I think it is it is certainly very intense. We um and but there is support at makers to people who who struggle in that in that regard. So if people are starting to feel burnt out, then um or or feeling burnt out, they can they can reach out to technical coaches and there's also a well-being team um that can provide one-to-one support to anyone who needs it. Um there's also um yoga and meditation available uh which which can help a lot with those kind of feelings um so um yes people sometimes um start to feel that way um but there is support on hand um and also as technical coaches we can um you know we can provide technical support to try and help there um and we can also try to kind of you know um in some ways sort of adjust adjust the program a little bit or try to make some some compromises to to give people the space they need in order to to recover so um uh i would say it's it's rare i would say it's rare that people like burn out and get to a point where they where they can't they can't do anything anymore i'd say it's very rare um but it's not it's not rare for people to find it difficult and need some support yeah, absolutely. And I think it's, you know, well worth thinking about, you know, when you're applying for the course, making sure it's the right time for you, you know, making sure you're prepared and you don't, um, because as you know, it's a big commitment it is, you know, a very intense um, situation you're in, you know, like, it's like mentally heavy. So I, I think I've previously some people have tried to work at the same time, you know, and it just doesn't, it doesn't work. And that's why um, in the interview stage, um, the, um, the team will ask a lot of questions about per- your personal like like how, how you're feeling it's not going to be all about the tech it's going to be really about how your lifestyle is and if this is going to fit into it because we want you to succeed we want and if, if it maybe if you maybe can't get into the July one because it just doesn't work for you then you can always get into the next month just make sure that you're you're um you're not uh, making sure you're like making plans that fit in with your with your life basically yeah uh, and I, think, I think we I mean we, we really genuinely we're a really mission driven company um so we you know we really genuinely want people to come to makers and have like a transformative experience and 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 get the job they they really want to get in in tech and so if we had people coming if we had a lot of people coming to makers and burning out and you know, being unable to 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 learn well and and complete the course, then we'd be totally failing, and we'd have to we'd we'd seriously have to you know look at ourselves and um, figure out what we're doing wrong. So um, uh, thankfully, we're not in that position. Yeah, exactly. Um, so unfortunately, we've just hit half past six. Um, so we're going to actually have to finish off the call, but. I know there's a few other questions. So um, what I'm going to do is take these all these questions and try to answer them in the follow-up email on Monday as best I can for you. Um, and if uh, 
you want to ask us anything else then please get in touch we are um you can get in touch through our linkedin uh on twitter instagram we will message you we're very active on there and we'll message you back or you can message us at contact at makers.tech um i'll pop that in the chat just now and um yeah any questions you have we'll be happy to answer it but yeah um anyway thank you so much for your questions there's been some amazing questions and yeah it's been brilliant and to have you all come to demo day and get to see the students firsthand and what they what they create so um yeah i hope i hope everyone has a good weekend and um hopefully we'll see you all soon thanks everyone bye bye, -bye. Thank you.